We walked down to the river, crossed it on a flat wooden bridge, and continued on the road on the other bank for a while. Then we followed a path down a steep slope. We stopped and looked back. It was drizzling rain. Only one arch remained of the iron bridge in the center of the city of Kalinin. The second was replaced by a wooden structure with many supports. Upstream is a barrier of logs to protect the bridge from floating mines. Here the Volga is still shallow and not very wide, about the same as the main near Bamberg. On either side of the banks were dugouts. There were gaping tunnels like mine entrances, passages and steps connecting small gun platforms and anti-aircraft guns on hilltops and ledges. Here and there digging and digging were in full swing. The noise of artillery firing resounded and echoed throughout the valley. The shots came from somewhere in the labyrinth of streets and ruins that gave the defenders of this city the opportunity to set up numerous ambushes. We kept moving. There was an extinct square, and beyond it a church with a ruined dome, from which the street went away in the direction of the enemy. It was as if everything had died out. Not even a hungry cat could be seen behind the piles of stones. Ruins towered above the piles of dislodged stones, the skeletons of houses with gaping window voids, the semblance of a roof. The devastation defied description. Everything is sprawled, smashed and turned to dust, flattened to the ground, mangled, scattered in different directions, with craters upon craters how to describe it all. The ground is strewn with shell casings, respirators, debris lying around, communication wires and wire, corrugated iron, poles. Leaning poles and tattered wire fencing block the road. Somewhere around the corner, tanks froze in anticipation, ready to break out of ambush when they were needed. Somewhere else a crowd of men stretched toward a stronghold deep in the ground past the Red Cross. Somewhere else, our camouflage trail stretched forward through turned gardens. We slipped through a narrow manhole into a series of surviving rooms of the house, which were as yet unblown by the wind. The concrete ceiling sagged under the weight of debris. Part of the basement was divided by double walls. Two doors slammed shut behind us, and we were in our den. How comfortable a cellar can be. The third bed was against the wall, beneath a map of Europe, a school map covering the territory from Spain to the Ural Mountains. I've seen you before, I thought. I'm familiar with those green lowlands, the brown tones, from lighter to darker, to indicate mountains, the blue ribbons of rivers. You look strikingly similar to the school maps of the publisher's Messier. Justice Perth's of the city of Gotha. Long forgotten days recall themselves. In cellars and shelters, there are corridors between the walls. There are passages through which you can slip outside and walk past the ruins to the next entrance. Several ladders rise up like pipes in the frames of the outer walls. If one climbs up one of them, each flight offers an increasingly impressive view of the gaping chasm. Here and there, a heating radiator still hangs over the abyss, and there is nothing else to remind you that people once lived here. Sometimes, the ruins look so fragile that you're afraid to cough lest you cause a collapse. This is the kind of place we operate in. At dusk, I walked a few hundred meters to the flank to re-establish communication. I fell into a deep hole and had to climb out of it on a slippery wall. Wading back in the inky darkness of night, watered by rain, and I won't bet it wasn't easy. I fell into sinkholes, stumbled into ditches, got tangled in wires and fences. There were rickety cobblestones and squelchy mud along the way. I ran into difficult obstacles and stepped on treacherous hoops. The only time I could see the trail was when a flash illuminated everything. It was just a strip of ground between the craters, but I leaped forward. At last I found shelter again, a barely discernible light from a boarded-up window. And that was our den. It seems doubly cozy now. The stove hums and grumbles. Sparks rise up the chimney. We made tea in a bucket and fried potatoes on a frying pan we found, who rolled himself a cigar and who gladly clenched a pipe in his teeth. What more could one want? I took command of the artillery communications section, and the battery headquarters gave me old Franz Wolf to assist me as a radio operator. 
The sun was shining brightly when we went to the shelter in which I had lately been stationed as forward observer. Snow covered the deserted area, turning the craters into soft depressions into which one could fall chest deep. In the evening, the moon hung over the haze that shrouded the harsh landscape. Machine guns rumbled, firing several bursts, a few flashes, and things quieted down in the sector. Last night, the temperature dropped from 33 degrees Fahrenheit to minus two. We sit behind the double doors of our dugout on the slope. A quilted blanket is hung between the two doors. The brick stove is a man's height, and when it's heated properly, Franz is sweating on the top bunk. We only put wood in it in the morning and evening, then the chimney is covered with tin and the brick and clay structure gives out heat hour after hour. I walked along the communication passage that runs through our position forward. It is well made. You can walk at full height, but here and there are signs warning of snipers. They take turns holding their position, waiting for their prey. Where the message passage passes into a rifle trench, you can also be calm. But companies get their allowance during the day. Sentries keep watch through trench periscopes, and machine gun firing points are camouflaged by a berm of snow that can be toppled at any time. Everyone on the front line has a new winter outfit. It is a typical German concern that there be a change of pants and jacket of protective gray or white. They have so many pockets, drawstrings and buttons that it takes a while to get anything out. Fur boots, muffs, wool helmets and hoods are included. Now we are protected from everything. It's approaching midday. The sentries stand at the barricade or silently gaze into the bubbling white no man's land, into this tattered, dangerous, wire-covered, minefield-covered strip of land, the distinctive features of which were named after the tanks that had been hit. Some time ago a group of men appeared in the trench. The man walking in front stopped at the first sentry. He was wearing a winter uniform like all the others. His face was covered by a wool cap and a steel helmet. You probably don't know me, he said. I'm your general. The sentry stood dashingly at attention and reported that all was in order. Fine, my boy, the general said, and pulled a chocolate out of his pocket. He must have had a solid supply, because no one he came across in the trench left empty-handed. General what it takes, the soldier said. November 5, 1942. The night was calm. Ice creaked on the road ruts. Lieutenant Mack and I were going on leave. We walked through the silent city. Goodbye, Kalanin. We glanced once more at its panorama. The last church gleaming in the moonlight, and in the gap we saw the reflections of the Volga. Then the last shacks disappeared from sight, and the countryside spread out before us. Our words, our breath, escaping from our lips, were carried away by the wind by that eternal breath of the Russian plane. At five o'clock we stood on the railroad tracks near the station, marked only by a few wagons stranded during the war. A small group of infantrymen were pacing back and forth. It was very cold. Finally a trickle of smoke appeared, rising higher and higher into the sky, and soon drew closer. A service train had arrived. A couple of passenger cars, some good freight flat cars, a puffing steam locomotive. We climbed on, and the others squeezed in. There were no long conversations, no signs of relaxation. Twice shells tore close to the tracks, and one of the shrapnel hit a wagon. The people in it hardly moved. In Viasma, we changed to a train with vacationers. In Smolensk, our journey was interrupted. Night and swirling snow, icy wind, silent hurrying figures with bulky luggage, dim electric light, and the unpleasant odor of crowded barracks. We went into town. We visited a barber shop, a mobile bookstore, a movie theater, and a mess hall. Then there was a new recreation room with nice big tables and solid chairs. There was music. It was nice and warm. There were chrysanthemums on the tables. Something inside us gradually thawed and it became unusually light at heart. A little happiness was sprouting timidly. We carried on a conversation. It was night again, the train again. Rifles stacked at the doors, sentries at the ends of the corridor. 
two stoves in each car. You can't get warm from steam heating alone. I crouched on the floor behind the stove. While I was lying there in a half slumber, I felt several people carefully moving my feet so that my boots did not touch the fire. I had no idea how many people walked over me that night. Vitebsk to Dinneberg, morning and mid-afternoon. Slowly the landscape was changing. More and more cultivated land. The steppes and scrubby thickets receded, and the horizon was framed by pleasant hills and forests, and again herds of cattle. What a marvelous sign of peaceful life. Lithuania carries with it the first breath of home, the pointed church, the clean streets, the big good houses. It was Saturday. A steamy sauna among meadows and little gardens. As the train left Dynaberg, someone sang out, In the homeland, in the homeland, a meeting awaits us. It was like a dam breaking. There are so many jokes about a soldier on leave who has returned from Russia, about how he marvels at civilization. That is really the way it is. When one returns from the East, one finds our civilization so advanced, so smoothly functioning, that at first it resembles a strange mechanism. It is amazing how civilized life is protected from adversity, how much comfort we require, what is in the order of things. Those who return know that nothing exists by itself, and yet the transition is easy, because we are such children of our era that we cannot imagine not taking advantage of these benefits. On the other hand, in such a short time, we don't have time to forget that what we are doing is extraordinary. As the vacation comes to an end, we can't get rid of thoughts of our fellow travelers. And thus, it all has a strange flavor. For this reason, I have no difficulty in returning. It's harder for those we left behind. For them, the languid waiting begins, a state of helplessness, an uncertainty that sharpens their perception of danger. They don't meet it face to face. You only recognize danger when it threatens you. The reason soldiers have self-control is that they can face danger and commiserate with it. Thus, a soldier is in a different position than the women and fathers I saw in the mornings waiting for the mail. Sometimes they found unpretentious work in the front garden because they did not want to give away their anxiety. But as for me, I returned to the front even more cold-blooded and confident. Front life looks clean and straightforward. Can I have regrets about that? It is not negotiable. We have taken our positions and talking only gives away our whereabouts. The soldier's solution here is not a tricky one either. As someone from East Prussia once said, wherever it takes you, you have to come to terms with it. That's the only way to do it. Pabst returned from vacation and found that the situation had changed dramatically. While he was away, the Red Army launched a winter counteroffensive, knocking the Germans out of Kalinin for the second and final time. The division rolled back to Rajev, to the southeast 100 kilometers. On December 4, I arrived in P. I was completing the last stage of my journey on a sledge. The snow cover was not great in some places, and yellow-brown patches of stubble were visible. All in all, it was a sad sight, a sad landscape with a water tower looming in the background. But we had new covered sleds with good trotters and a heat-retaining arc-shaped plywood tent that could be covered with snow blocks and used as a mobile fighting unit. The dugouts everywhere looked quite secure. Kalinin was abandoned on December 15. It is out of the question that it was left for strategic reasons. The need for it was much more important. We had to retreat before the enemy assault. The division in whose sector the breakthrough occurred, meanwhile, was disbanded. The remainder of its men were distributed to other divisions. The withdrawal took place in the prescribed order, but it meant the destruction of stores of uniforms and food, surgical equipment, and other medical supplies. The wounded were taken out. The confusion during the first days of the retreat must have been total. Our unit lost its direction of travel three times during one night. A stalled transport was destroyed, most of the time with all its cargo. Our divisional communications center had only 25% of its cargo transport left. I found my unit again on December 25, about 75 kilometers south of Kilinin. They had taken up positions there three days earlier. It was necessary to hold the line of defense here. 
The enemy was developing the offensive with Siberian ski battalions and Cossack squadrons so that the infantry could not, under any circumstances, withdraw from the battle. But the enemy found no decent shelter. We burned everything. And still on December 29 our sector was bombarded not only by mortars and light artillery, they pulled up the Katyushas as well. At that time, Franz was on post as an artillery observer far ahead in the village. The enemy attacked the village fourteen times during the night of the 30th. There was now no more sleep. 3. Had frostbitten feet. On the 31st our new regimental commander came to the village and said, Well, lads, build your dugouts, pull up explosives and entrench yourselves. A quarter of an hour later came the order to fold up and join the unit immediately. When they arrived at our village, another seven kilometers further on, our vehicles were loaded and everything was ready to go. The first houses had already come under fire from the Russian guns. When we left the village a little later, sparks were raining down. The night was red, the columns were moving through the snow. There was great cold, and the air was absolutely still. Around us the villages were ablaze in a wide ring, a terrible and beautiful sight, breathtaking in its splendor and nightmare at the same time. With my own hands I threw burning logs into the barns and granaries beyond the road. Then with my companion, I rode to catch up with the unit. That night we retreated twenty-three kilometers, and on January 1, another twenty. The boys of our reconnaissance battalion, who arrived at six o'clock on the morning of the new year, said they had lost forty men killed, after leaving K. At K one of the three battalions of the regiment had been disbanded to replenish the other two. The battalion to which I was assigned while at K was refilled on October 2. Now on December 31st, there were one hundred and twenty men left in it. On the last day of the old year, Major Christoph left us to take on another squad. Looking back, I remember that when he took command over us a year ago, it was like a relief. In the months of brutal fighting that followed, he became the center of attention of the squad. The more difficult the situation, the more confidence he instilled that everything would be all right. He could be stern, but when things seemed to be taking a turn for the worse, his sternness turned to kindness. He had a few words of encouragement and he would set a clear task for everyone. Then everything would go well. He was a born leader. He arrived unannounced. No rumors preceded his arrival. He was at home everywhere. For all the brutal discipline, when his tall, heavy figure appeared in an artillery position, everyone's heart was at ease. He would appear at the observation post no later than the second day. When he left us, the heavy howitzers sang him a farewell serenade. He must have read all the respect, love and devotion in the eyes of his men because he was loved by all. It was dark at 3 o'clock p.m., and at 5 o'clock p.m., it was deep night, when our patrol of eight men and a sentry from a neighboring company swung over the berm of the trench. They were quickly lost in the shaky whiteness of no man's land. Only the heavy crunching of the snow was barely overlapped by the crackle of our machine gun bursts as they slipped through the gap in the wire fence. For a moment there was almost complete silence. At a distance of thirty meters, the fighters lay close to the enemy trench. We could see the dark embrasure of a machine gun nest in the place where the sentries were to break through. We waited tensely for the denouement. Did the enemy notice anything? No? How long seconds can last? Then everything suddenly happened very quickly. A few shadows flashed. Rushing forward, a quick movement, a thud in the trench, the first burst from a submachine gun. One of our own, or one of the enemy's machine guns, it must be ours, judging by the distinctive boom. Muffled bursts of hand grenades were heard, a second burst of machine gun fire. Then one man came back, the patrol commander. He staggered back and plopped down in the trench. Fire. Cover them with fire. They've handled everything themselves. But there was no need to resort to heavy weapons. The boys had done the work themselves. They had no thought of retreating. Exactly according to plan they accomplished their mission, half of them bombarding from behind the bunker, the other half operating in the trench itself. 
the enemy tried to cut them off. The Russians crawled up from the trenches, six to eight men on each side. But the scouts kept throwing grenades, giving the enemy no respite. They suppressed several machine gun firing points with concentrated explosions, but after that they lost a general view of the enemy trench system. A field officer ran after them and brought them back. On the way they threw an anti-tank mine trap into the machine gun nest nearest our trench. Total luck. Three machine gun firing points and 18 men. Enemy casualties. Clear the trench. Everyone back to their dugouts, shouted the company commander. But it took another half hour before the enemy opened indiscriminate harassing fire, but even that ceased after a while. Ivan must have suffered a good shock. At the same time, the scouts of the other company captured five enemy soldiers. Through the entrance to the dugout one by one, the men hesitantly entered. Finally, they were together again, the whole patrol. They wanted to see what had become of the scout commander, badly wounded. Damn them, the sergeant said in a squeaky voice. In four weeks, I'll be back in the ranks. Then I'll get even with them, the bastards. I now know where their trench is. January 10, 1943. Schnapps. Obligatory. Sugar. Desirable. Water. As a supplement. Based on a recipe consecrated by centuries, adding a few lemons, we brewed grog. On the guitar and accordion we performed musical pieces, which were transmitted to other dugouts through the communication line. Subsequently, the company asked our ensemble to play at a birthday party. We grabbed the instruments under the arm and walked along the moonlit trench. How quiet it suddenly became between the two islands of merriment. The bent figure of my companion, walking with a gliding gait along the wind-blown trench, was hidden behind the high perambulation of the wall gleaming from the white snow. Our footsteps were muffled by the loose snow, and the frost had formed thick ice on the wires and branches. Calmness in our sector leaves bitterness in the mouth. The guys at Stalingrad have a hard time. In the morning we were somewhat disturbed. Ivans took offense at the smoke billowing from our dugout. Grinkovich looked doubtfully at the ceiling and Franz, who was just about to go for a morning walk, sprinted back, cursing. The explosion had thrown him headfirst into a garbage pit. In the course of all this we indulged in a little banter. Several hand grenades were tossed into the dugout of the doctor, who was serenely reading a book at the time. The accompanying noise was deceptively natural, and the blackened marks in the fresh snow looked just like the real thing. Today we talked about what was going on in ourselves, trying to listen to our feelings. We remembered many things, especially the events of last winter. Our conclusions were not very accurate. Feelings can no longer figure in the arsenal of our evaluations. We don't hesitate to do things the thought of which would never have occurred to us if it ever happened to us, that an opportunity arose to avoid doing them, we would take it as a joke. And the spectacles that once shook us so deeply, we now regard with philosophical impartiality. Franz told me that during his vacation he once started a conversation about the retreat from Kalinin. It took place in mail company. But he was looked at with such incomprehension that realizing the inappropriateness of such a conversation, he fell silent. He spoke to us of his grandmother, whose mother had told us of the War of 1870. Its horrors are still vivid in the memory of succeeding generations. We talked about the bloody battles of Gravelot and Mars Latour, and then the Great War and the chaos that followed, the revolution, and the formation of new spheres of power. Once again, we have tried to understand the time in which we live, the end of a certain period of history a masquerade of absurdity in which the world collapses. The thermometer has dropped to 45 degrees below zero. The snow glistens and swirls with beautiful crystals. Every step throws them up. They glisten in the sun and reflect the evening light. At night, the snow glistens bluishly under the light of the moon, making the landscape more stark than ever. Some time ago, I returned from the observation post to my dugout. As I skied, the snow crunched beneath my feet. Deep breaths burned my lungs and my eyelashes iced over. The creaking of the sled on the road could be heard for miles on a windless night. 
How nice to enter a warm shelter with a welcoming roundel of lights. Snow sprinkled like a shower from my woolen helmet as I shook it off. Grankowitz took off my outer garments. Since the day we arrived, he had taken over all the housekeeping duties. Washing dishes, cleaning the room, monitoring the supplies. If anyone wanted to pour their own coffee, Grankowitz took offense. He had his quirks. Who doesn't? We have to accept each other for who we are. And if that's not possible, we say so. In this way, we have created an island of peace in the midst of war, where camaraderie is easy to establish and one can always hear someone's laughter. I often pick up the guitar. Haining sent me, Kilometerstein, a songbook with many long-forgotten tunes. In the evening we sing old soldier songs, both heartfelt and sentimental, ironic and funny. And when we're having a hard time, we sing, too. Last night I bent over a letter. It wasn't a real letter, just a scrap of paper that came from far away, through a huge outpouring of bitterness and grief. It affected me more than I can put into words. There are times when we are helpless, when last leave all our will. At such moments our heart leaps foolishly. Then we run our hand over our eyes and slam the door shut tightly because we have to force ourselves to move in a direction we don't want to go. But really, our heart beats as it always has, and we listen to the sound behind the door, knowing full well that all the things that give meaning to our lives are there. So we are ostracized just like Don Quixote, and pain makes us who we really are. What a wide range of opinions about the future shape of the world. Differences not only vertically, between nations, but horizontally between factions as they prepare for a battle along with the battle of armies. Many of our enemies now see the need for peace after war. Staying here is a release from evil and animal passions, cowardice and filth. War requires a man to give his whole self. The guns speak unequivocally, beyond wishful thinking. It is about 44 degrees of frost. Snow flies around the ruins and accumulates in the broken houses. Nature continuously sweeps everything away. No footprints remain. Not a single human footprint. Not a single shell crater. The landscape turns urban, and the houses are mere decorations for the gun mouths sticking out between them. A narrow path winds ribbon-like along a gleaming wide street. At night I walk along it in the shimmering moonlight under pale blue arcs of flashes. Then I turn down a fork to a steep hollow slope and up again to the dugout at the far end. January 25, 1943. 6.45. All three of us awake with the start of the attack. Artillery shelling. So, they are attacking after all. The question is, after what? We're trying to guess the caliber of the guns and the weight of the shells. The sound is familiar. Our movements are businesslike, and we're in a mood of cheerful tension. We sniff the air with our noses like hunters who have smelled their prey. The telephone rings. Reports are hurriedly relayed and questions are asked, indicating the degree of our tension. Attack on the company's position on the right. The enemy in the trench of the company's advanced position. Communication from the rear is broken. All lines are cut. We're switching to radio. Infantry guns respond. Soon the regiment is subjected to shelling zones 12 and 13. Above us flying shells on cross trajectories. 7.30. Attacking chains of Russian support groups have been pinned down by barrage fire. An attack on two companies further down the right flank was repulsed, partly in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The breakthrough was eliminated, and the tank attack on the left was smothered. Reserves were pulled up, and the line patrol returned under enemy fire, gradually weakening. The ravine behind the firing position is riddled with streaks of blackened snow, 200 meters wide. The snow looks as if it had been burned. Cobblestones and clods of earth are encountered along the way. 9. 15. In the middle of the trench occupied by the enemy continues to hold a group of ours. Our snipers control the communication trench between the battalion headquarters and the company on the right. They are shooting every Russian who escapes the barrage or tries to retreat. Our forward observer there is having a field day, firing guns, utilizing all their capabilities. The enemy is stopped. 
His rocket launchers are firing indiscriminately on the sector. 10.10. The enemy does not stop trying to break forward. But the telephone connection has long been restored, and the regiment has every single battery in touch. It is good to hear the fire control commands. At the infantry position they are listening to music again. Jochen Grinkowitz has just returned from a line detour. There were six cliffs on this side at one spot alone. Imagine, he said, I was fixing the line, spread out like a pancake, when a company messenger passed by. Hello, Jochen, having a good time. Wait a minute, I said, where are you going? Aya, to the movies. And by golly, he went into town. Before noon the sun shone, and the trench was again in our hands. The counterattack met with little resistance. The encircled group held on the whole time. Our casualties were surprisingly low. One deserter from the Volga told us that of the 300 Russians who attacked the trench, 200 had been killed by the time he deserted. The rest had fallen under snipers' bullets and grenade explosions, and the supporting echelon had rolled back under artillery blasts. Between our own trench and the enemy's barbed wire, we could count 550 bodies of the dead. The number of captured weapons was represented by eight heavy and light machine guns, 30 submachine guns, five flamethrowers, four anti-tank guns, and 85 rifles. This was a Russian penalty battalion of 1,400 men. They would no longer be able to field one like it against us again. At 8.30 p.m., 15 columns, each of about 13 men on sledges and with equipment, were reported to have turned into the woods toward our positions. At 8.45 p.m., 40 or 50 more men were added. The shells of the artillery of the whole regiment, howling, rushed toward the woods. The ricocheting fragments of heavy shells created an infernal noise, bursting four or five meters above the ground. Our own created a deafening, organ-like sound, rumbling rapidly through the icy air. This detachment of Russians also no longer troubled us. Sinning is heard, in the sector a happy lull. The sky is delightfully blue, the tension is on the wane. Ivan no longer gets in our way. Snow flies in the air, showing up in the sun as a black-brown color with numerous white gaps. Our aerial observer is still flying overhead, glittering and sparkling as he rushes toward the enemy batteries, destroying them one by one. It is almost midday. Seven Russian guns have already fallen silent. The day before yesterday. That's a long time ago. The dead will soon be covered in snow if Ivan doesn't come to pick up the bodies. It's the first time he's done that in our memory. But he is taking new losses in the process. We've heard official word and commentary about our actions here. But on the other hand, we talked about Stalingrad. Von Paulus surrendered on January 31st. There is not much to talk about. We knew for a long time what was going on there. But we also knew that the Russian reserves were not inexhaustible. They would be exsanguinated with stark inevitability. We could compare the losses suffered. We count the dead, and there is no deception here. We simply count the dead we see. Our total losses for the two days did not reach a tenth of the number of bodies of enemy soldiers still lying in no man's land. The conclusion is inescapable. The wind still howls, shrill and pitiful. At some bends in the trench it whips up shivering columns of snow dust. When we poke our heads out from behind the barrier, it bites us on the face. Above the steps of our dugout, the snow has piled up like barchins in the desert, more than a meter and a half high. But the wind blows towards the enemy embrasures, blinding the eyes of the sentries. It's all for the best. The 10th Company Scouts are going on patrol tonight. Lieutenant Camp is happy. His voice on the phone sounded ringing and cheerful. Congratulations sprinkled to the 10th Company from all positions. The scouts returned without casualties. They suddenly appeared 300 meters from the trench, blew up five dugouts and six firing machine gunpoints, took two tongues, captured two anti-tank guns, two automatic rifles and ten rifles, including four automatic rifles, repulsed two counterattacks in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and stopped fighting only when ammunition was running low. On the way back, they destroyed a camouflaged dugout, 
with 15 soldiers. The enemy lost 39 men killed. The infantry and artillery worked together coherently like clockwork. That sort of thing is encouraging. Very good, camp, very good, Colonel Zickwolf was saying. Tomorrow you can put your men on the list of those to be presented for the award. The whole regiment was in high spirits. Our ally may turn out to be a blizzard. February 7, 1943. At a speed of 45 kilometers per hour wind sweeps the snow. He huge clouds carried under low floating clouds. The sky and the earth are drowned in a single howl. Visibility is 400 meters. The sunlight is fading fast. I was making my way into the sauna. The sentries on the bridge hid in secluded corners where they stood silent and looked clumsy in their fur coats and straw-wrapped boots. Two human figures appeared on the slopes descending to the Volga, gliding carelessly on skis. Apart from them, I noticed no one, except solitary figures appearing and disappearing like snow clouds. They passed by without a glance or a hello, wanting only one thing, to get to their destination as quickly as possible. When I returned, the entrance to the dugout was again covered with snow. I slid down the drift. A snow mat had formed between the two doors. Snow piled up in every crevice, in the folds of my clothes, and by my collar as I lifted the canopy at the entrance to slip down. It was a lovely day again. The wind had turned east, and the temperature had dropped to 22 degrees frost. Returning from my observation post, I read until the light became too dim. Then I cast a glance to the side and saw Grinkowitz standing in front of the stove. His face was illuminated by the fire, and the air smelled of smoke and bread browned on the fire. Franz was sitting on his bunk with his legs dangling. The outlines of objects became hazy. The colors faded. We did not speak. Only the noise of our movements could be heard in a room lit by the fire of a burning stove and with a gradually darkening window. Twilight. So strange. Feeling unreal is this time between the day gone and the day to come. When Grinkowitz lit the candle in the corner by the stove, it was already evening. From the shelf peeked out our pleasing dishes, white cups, gold-rimmed saucers, small plates with floral designs. How unsightly they all looked when we fished them out of the ruins. And now how everything sparkled, the wall by the stove, the cheerful colors of the blankets on the bunks making them cozy, the white papered ceiling lit with dark red light, I thought of all this as Grinkowitz, placing a candle on the table, arranged the dishes, carefully placed the butter and meat on a plate, and carefully cut the bread into slices. Then even Franz made an effort and came out of his reverie, plunged into reality. He muttered, Is this all the meat there is? Yes, said Grinko. And that is quite enough. There was no more to cook. He smiled slightly with the corners of his mouth the way he always does when he gets lucky at poker. Grinko calculates food supplies. He has an admirable habit of deceiving us for our own benefit. He stockpiles secret supplies and gives them away for breakfast, holds back precious sugar, withholding it for coffee in order to surprise us at tea, when otherwise good tea would be spoiled by saccharin. In short, he is a born homemaker. And when he pulls a little trick on us, his whole face brightens up. But this time, Franz was not so easily reassured. Something had spoiled his sense of humor. After dinner, he exploded. He suddenly seized his cup, held it in his hand as if to estimate its weight, and cast a testing glance at the corner of the stove. Look here, he said, a mouse. Lord, not with our best Chinese porcelain, burst out Grinkowitz, who rummaged behind his back and thrust a rifle into Franz's hand. Come on out here. Little friend, Franz muttered, cocking the trigger while piercing the darkness with his gaze. Then there was a rumble, a flash, and the smell of gunpowder. The mouse lay on the boards, killed by a shot through the head. It's a crude method, but we don't have a mousetrap. The other day we had a visit from the divisional chaplain. The meal was interrupted in a similar manner. He confessed afterward that when he came in he was surprised why there was a pistol on the table at dinner time. We seemed to him a rather belligerent rabble, found our way quite good, 
but afterward he had a ringing in his ears for half an hour. It's regrettable. Following the victory at Stalingrad, the Russians launched an offensive westward from Voronezh, and on February 7 liberated Kursk. Kharkov fell another eight days later, putting von Manstein and von Kleist in danger of being cut off. At the same time, Hitler finally heeded the advice of his experts that the forward position on the outskirts of Moscow was unsuitable to hold the defense. Orders were given to the troops there to withdraw in order to form a denser and straighter line of defense covering Smolensk. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I spent the whole day saying goodbye to my books. This time I divided between reading the conversations of Frederick the Great and Henry de Cat and Pierre Champion's Little Impressions of Paris. I found a few excerpts that I really liked. One has to become a terrible barbarian, my gracious sovereign, in order to subdue some troublemakers who, as it were, have gotten into our fight quite against their will, or cultivate sensitivity. It is one of the highest gifts of nature. Even if it creates many complications for us, it is a source of many positive emotions, if combined with common sense. Total war can destroy the distinction between soldiers and civilians, but it will always be considered shameful if weapons are used against women and children. And as for good nations, they are enjoined to abide by the conventions governing action on prisoners of war. You can do your duty without being forgotten and you will have to refrain from certain acts if you see the state of affairs in the right perspective. The post office delivered to me a parcel from Yo with samples of quimper pottery. Bon, like myself, loves rough luxury and rich colors. They look strangely cheerful in this oriental world, and they fill me with sadness because they remind me of the richness of that life of ours, the memory of which becomes buried deeper with each coming year. We have to fight to keep from withering away and humbling ourselves. A vessel that stands too long in an arid atmosphere begins to crack. So I tuck things into my satchel when we get off the ground, because that's what we're going to do. We're moving away from our dugout into the snow. We're going to shorten the front line, because that's the prudent thing to do. Because it's good that something has to happen. Because a little more or a little less doesn't matter in this country. We've been stuck here on the Rzhev bridgehead long enough. We are well acquainted with it, with this city, with its geometrically correct streets. Ruins of churches, three bridges over the Volga with its steeply sloping banks, ravines, ruins of stone buildings, where our observers are located on the northern bank. From there we have a wide view of the enemy positions through trenches and snow bunkers. The terrain can be seen all the way to the hills, where once there were villages, but now we can only guess at them by the orphaned rows of tall trees beyond the reach of our guns. Our trenches stretched out in front of the bastion. Directly in front of them were the tanks that had been hit. All this was imprinted in our memory, became part of our lives, because willy-nilly we had to live with it. Goodbye, Rishev, the city of rope makers and churches. There's not much left of you. We leave you without a fight but the enemy will remember that he cannot take credit for this stone from our bastion. We undermine the railroad. We're bringing down the towers. We won't just leave you, doing nothing at all, because your women and children would rather go with us. When the bridge that once carried trains to Sturitza blows up, it will be a signal. But you won't know that. Soon only Field Flebel Jacob and his men will be left here, north of the Volga. February 17. 1943. We've heard the official message. I can't deny that it caused us bitter irony. They speak of desperate fighting in Kharkov, where fifty tanks were hit. If that was all that Kharkov was defended with, it is deplorable. They could have been winding down there as well by now. An army that keeps getting pounded is not worth much anymore. I apologize. That's how it seems to me. Maybe we're being unfair to them. But if what we think we mean by SS divisions, Greater Germany, Reich, and Adolf Hitler, is true, then we only understand it too well. These are not squads of recruits, not mercenaries, not glorified assault divisions to pin our hopes on. These are old men who have been through the fire, those who stand to the death. It is at least significant that the troops all the time continued to remain on Lake Ladoga and on Lake Ilmen 
and in their muddy trenches on the Volkov. And as far as I know, these are not SS units. You can see them in the news movies, which we don't put them in anything here. Once our battalion hit 18 tanks near the village of Bishenki, Martinov had 20 vehicles hit on a front of 300 meters. In the woods near Tabrikov, had to establish the order of who to allow to open fire next, because at first they all, the major, adjutant, and duty officer, hunted them, leaving the command post. Even the anti-tank gun surgeon left his gun and took part in the hunt with a magnetic mine, and the tanks were arriving every day. Day by day, the companies became smaller and smaller. This went on day and night and hour after hour, but our Bavarians stood to the death. In these battles, the artillery regiment lost 25 men alone, not counting the observers. We lost a lot of men at the expense of those who suffered at the evacuation point. From malaria, rheumatism, influenza, and God knows what else. They were mostly tough guys. It is an old truth. Strength is not the main thing. It's the skinny ones who are used to physical labor that last longer. Franz and I are in good health. Franz found himself a doll. It happens. She has a round oriental face, strong legs, and a nice blue dress. We named her Babette. She sits on top of my guitar, and Franz swears that he will sleep with her tonight. Bye bye. Baby. At 3.00, I received orders in the morning to take up my duties as a liaison officer in the infantry. At half past ten, I was with Colonel Zickwolf just in time to wish him a happy birthday. He left me for lunch and coffee. In the meantime, my boys had made themselves comfortable in the dugga belonging to the departing squad leader. I must say, to put it in high-flown terms, it is a villa view on the Volga. In the meantime, it was necessary to put everything in order. Tomorrow another of our famous patrols leaves. We'll have to give the pigeons something to peck at. The evacuation seems to be delayed. There's artillery shelling to the west. We are not worried. Everything is fine. Yesterday I was busy from morning till late afternoon. At dawn, an enemy patrol broke into our trench. It cost us one man killed, but the enemy lost three men and another was taken prisoner. According to information received from the prisoner, the place where our patrol was to go this morning was the assembly area. The patrol was therefore prepared for a counterattack. With my old communications men I pushed forward through a heavy blizzard. In such bad weather we could not control the firing commands, and we had an unpleasant experience when two short bursts were fired at us. One of them nearly killed me, the other killed two in the trench. But still the patrol was on the alert and blew up the assembly point. The accident threw a lot of work on me. I was torn between company and battalion, and between Colonel Zickwolf, and the regimental command of my regiment. When at last I got home, I slept thirteen hours. Today I dictated a full report on the patrol, entered the latest developments in my diary, and in the evening answered the telephone relentlessly because of the shelling. It is now past midnight, but all the regimental guns are still firing. This is the third such shelling. I am terribly exhausted, otherwise I am doing well. When daylight began to break, the storm was still howling, and Ivan was sitting in the trench again. It was in the positions of the Ninth Company, where seven Russians out of twenty-five had broken through. There had been a short, brutal fight, hand-to-hand -hand combat. There was no time to fire. There was only enough time to take a short swing of the rifle and put the butt of the rifle to the nearest skull. In twenty-five minutes the trench was free again. The enemy had lost three killed. One surrendered as a prisoner. The prisoner reported that 100 men remain in reserve at the enemy's positions, which we call Hearth of Terror and Dugout Posadas. They arrived last night. We are preparing a counterattack. This afternoon we rushed into the attack with the wind blowing in our faces. It blew with such force that we could hardly keep on the narrow icy paths. Clouds of snow dust were blowing over the barriers. The wire, Tanks, craters and ruins of the park disappeared in the white blizzard. The enemy positions 40 meters from our trench looked like an island in the blizzard. 
The artillerymen estimated the distance, but even the shells of the heaviest guns disappeared without a trace under the shroud of snow. We heard only the rumble of bursts from shells that had fallen somewhere. As a result of all this, we had to give up shelling dugout posed. The infantry must do without adequate artillery preparation. At 8.30, the heavy guns will fire on the area for only one minute. The rest is at the discretion of the personnel of the 9th. As always, the last, most important stage always goes to the infantry, and no one can help them when they take over. 8.00. They're getting ready. They load their machine guns, secure their equipment, grab bags of grenades and build steps in the trench out of empty ammunition boxes. All the while the observers with heavy artillery creep 30 meters to the rear, behind the ruins of the house, and their artillery has moved its fire back 25 meters behind the trench line. Three surgeons and 16 soldiers nestled against the bumper, ready to jump. 8.25, 8.29, another minute, 30 seconds, the hands of the calibrated clock moving toward zero, heavy and light howitzers, infantry guns, mortars. The fire is coming close to the trench, Black smoke wall bursts upwards, and the infantry burst under the last bursts of their own guns. That sudden wild rush, like a cat leaping through treacherous snow, a second of deadly breathless suspense, in which the eyes of all are fixed on the thin line of the chain of soldiers moving swiftly, in great leaps, across no man's land. With the last shell they are, already in the trench of the enemy. Like a thunderstorm, the patrol rushed at them splitting and scattering to either side of the trench. The first dugouts explode, machine gun firing points explode, ugly mushroom-shaped puffs of black smoke rise up, grenades complete the destruction of the enemy's manpower, and smaller, weaker explosions wave forward. Over squelching mud and through falling brown figures, the scout squad makes its way. One shell flies into the dugout without bursting. Enemy soldiers jump out and fall one on top of the other under machine gunfire. A grenade completes the rest. The men's faces are blackened. Some are scratched. Heavy artillery pulls up to the edge of the woods. It covers the supply trench, but can't stop the reinforcement forces from infiltrating. The enemy gathers forces for a counterattack. Three of them are repulsed. Then the reconnaissance unit withdraws from the battle. The fire of heavy artillery is again transferred to the trench. The last to get in is Field Flevin Jacob. They're all back, blackened with caked mud, exhausted. A red trail stretches up from the trench to the medical station. But there, on the enemy side, on a front of 200 meters, blown up 10 dugouts and 20 firing machine gun points, destroyed 11 heavy machine guns and one 45mm anti-tank gun. Seventy to ninety bodies of dead lay in the trench. The scouts penetrated right into the heart of the gathering. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. It was so warm today that we stretched out in the sun like cats, squinting happily at its rays. I got up on skis and crossed the Volga, falling twice on a steep slope. I came back so ruddy and energized by the sun that life played in my blood again. The snow on the south slope had already melted. Water flowed in streams over the rows of steps leading to the dugouts. The one we live in now is a work of art. It is a large rectangle with partitioned off sleeping quarters. The lower half of the walls are lined with smooth boards. The upper half is covered with light wooden tiles. The ceiling is covered with white paper. The transoms above are paneled with smooth edged boards. There is a sitting place in the corner, a shelf, a round table, all very comfortable. Since yesterday I have been at the artillery communication point and have been performing the duties of an artillery scout with the rear guard. There is one battalion left in the regiment sector. It was fairly quiet until 12 o'clock today, then followed an intense fire on the sector of the 9th Company, the bridge over the Volga and the southern part of the city. It was led by artillery, mortars, and anti-tank guns. Two hundred men were advancing from Blindezhny Posit. The duel was played out. I watched it all from the roof of a large stone building. The enemy broke into our trench. 
I moved the barrage another hundred and fifty meters back, so that he was almost at our positions. The enemy was driven back, leaving from twenty-five to thirty men killed, and one captured. 14.30 In Zone 18 Ivan is in the trenches. He can no longer be thrown back. We are surrounded. We are left with four light and one 100mm gun from the entire battery sector of the division. Observation posts are scattered far apart. The points that most trouble us are on the flanks and in the center, in Zone 15, dug out Posadas. The enemy is trying again and again to attack here, but in small forces. The telephone is not silent all the time. I carry it with me between the dugout and the observation post, up the impossibly wide ladder that stands outside, set against the wall of the house, and then across the boards between a number of chimneys to a point at the end of the north wall. There I stand on a second, narrower ladder and look over the parapet. 17.30. Two light batteries move out. The other two remain behind the first new rearguard position and open fire, firing another thousand rounds before 21.00. The rearguard companies withdraw from the battle with the enemy. The last lines of telephone communication are being rolled up. For a short time, we switch to radio communication. On the left flank, the enemy exploits his breakthrough but the withdrawal from the battle is carried out as planned. Villa view on the Volga is blown up. Captain Gross and Lieutenant Schubert are still standing alone on the road. We pack up and pull back as well. Under a bridge on the road leading from the front, a small group from battalion headquarters stands waiting for the last companies to leave the trenches. In the sky in the northern part of the city, the Katyushas are firing their rockets. This area is already a no-man's land, a strange atmosphere of excitement and danger, with only the vague silhouettes of fighting men prowling like wolves in search of prey. We cross the Volga for the last time on the bridge. At regimental headquarters, the officers, pale and tense, huddle around Colonel Zickwolf. Will everything be just right? A hissing carbide lamp casts a cold light, dimly illuminating the bare dugout. My task was accomplished. When I stepped outside, the small group was ready to march, and we marched away. Feeder's horse moved. The wagon rolled. We turned our backs to the Volga. Black pits gaped on the road. The forward posts stood at the very minefields. Flames burst from the stone building, blazing red in the window cavities, roaring furiously through the roof. The landscape had become desolate over the past few days. Our notable landmarks, houses and water towers no longer existed. Explosives were ready to be planted under the remaining objects. Soon, we were on an open road. Ahead of us, we could still see the rearguard batteries firing. Then they were left behind, guns and gun fronts at the ready, the shadows of men and horses with their heads down. The road was flanked by a barrier of ice. We stumbled and slid, walking through round, muddy, frozen puddles in which the ice cracked and water spurted out, while Fyodor strained with all his might at his reins. We caught up with the dark columns. They were leaving at a rapid march. To the south, a column of light from the giant conflagration soared into the sky like a searchlight beam directed sharply downward, and the snow was colored a warm soft red. Our necks were scalding cold with the northeast wind blowing the fine snow and tearing the clouds in front of us to shreds, revealing a clear starry night. At 8.30 p.m., lightning flashed in a streak behind us, filling the landscape from horizon to horizon. It was an unforgettable sight. Bridges over the Volga, the last water towers. Now they no longer exist. Soon the last of our men would be returning crossing the river straight across the ice. We moved on. We marched all the time. Sometimes we remembered our dugout. We sang, because we had to keep our spirits up somehow. After a two-hour rest in a crowded standing room, we continued on our way while the rearguard battalion pulled up. They came out of the battle as planned. It was quite in keeping with the true state of affairs that things did not seem to be going quite smoothly. Flashes were going up. The enemy was attacking, but the assault guns were already gathering back to the front. 
rumbling monsters in a night white with snow swirls. When I reached the unit at six o'clock in the morning, I could do nothing but warm my hands for half an hour, clasping a mug of hot coffee between my palms. I was too tired to eat. Then it got better. I took off my boots and noticed that the socks and cords were soaked with blood. I fell asleep. Good morning. Good night. At three o'clock, the next morning we resumed our movement. The fire was tinting the turquoise sky. How could a barbaric spectacle be so enchanting, so indescribably beautiful? At seven o'clock, we were ready for action, and I caught myself acting as artillery liaison of the Grenadier Strike Regiment. I stood behind a snow berm and watched the marching columns of Russians advancing from behind a small river. I watched them form into companies and move forward on motorized sleds. Then our artillery covered them. At 1.50 p.m., we continued the march. From the window, a woman who had stayed behind for some reason of her own showed her child the German soldiers for the last time. There was despair in her eyes. We marched on. Night came on. We rested for two hours in crowded houses, then continued the march. The wind blew with snow. Flashes tore through the sky. When the columns stopped, we tried to find shelter from the wind. The riders lay in front of their horses, prostrate with their faces to the ground, with their hands around their rifles, furry and shapeless in their tulips, looking like bears or tibetans. We marched along with the battery. The gunshots made the snow take on a purple hue. Noon. We rested for three hours, sleeping two of them. Then again, we continued the march. The sun was burning our faces. The snow glistened. Our lips were beginning to crack. When the sun went behind the hills on the other side of the big river, we were proceeding to point A. It was like a parade. Men, horses, and wagons marching, stamping their step. In the evening, as we settled around the table, there were deep furrows of wrinkles on our faces, those characteristic lines from the corners of our eyes and nose. In the morning, the guns were ready for action. Since the day before yesterday, we have been in a new rearguard position. In spite of the strain, I am perfectly fine. The sun is shining brightly, and a little later I will drive on with Franz Wolf in our small radio van. We don't expect combat contact with the enemy until tomorrow. Just as I was finishing my report in a hurry, a Russian fighter plane attacked. It sent dirt onto my paper, and the trench blast knocked out by the shock wave hit me in the back. Lieutenant K was wounded. In the afternoon I went with Franz Wolf and Ian Braun as artillery liaisons for Eula Battalion. We again had our small wagon with our horse fader as draft power. Ian was the charioteer and operator at the same time. We went over the hills under the blindingly bright rays of the sun. Six Russian bombers were approaching with four of our fighters on their tails. They pressed them down. Before the furious pursuit disappeared behind the trees, two of the big Russian planes rolled onto their sides and crashed, leaving plumes of smoke behind them. We crossed the Dnieper, which here is no wider than the Kinzig. At N, the infantry went into position, entrenching and moving in small groups on a level strip of ground in front of a wooded strip where the enemy would appear. A blow was struck on the left flank of the regiment. The enemy force has broken through and is already holding territory. The flank is being reinforced. We put forward permanent sentries and prepare for the attack. March 8, 1943. The enemy approaches a force of 5,000 men on the left flank of the division. Our fire adjusters report on their movements. Our own attack is already meeting strong resistance, but by evening everything calms down again. The sun sets in unusually picturesque colors, spreading a smoky golden glow, contrasting with the clear blue shadows of the winter night that moved slowly toward the east. Two of us walked through fields of hardened snow, while Franz got into a wagon to drive roundabout across the bridge. As they moved away, they became smaller and smaller against the desolate landscape. Fedor, the wagon, and Franz in the coachman's seat. Then they approached us again across the gentle hills. We found the battery ready to move out. The houses were empty with all those signs of final flight, which make human habitation so dismal. We joined the column and marched toward the setting sun. 
evening had come on. The way became more difficult, and a prickly wind was blowing. It was no longer gentle and playful, but blue and hard as steel. It grabbed my face and blew through my whole body. I was cold in my thin overcoat, with no shirt underneath. I asked for a tulip, but it weighed heavily on my tired shoulders. Something was wrong with my left knee. We had already covered ten kilometers, and there were thirty more to go. Fatigue clutched my head in a dull, deafening hoop. In the end only my feet continued on, step by step, stumbling clumsily in the wind. For the last two kilometers, the road ran through deep snow, away from the main road. I walked slowly like a very old man. From the ravine behind me, where the cars were stuck, the driver's curses echoed in the icy night, like the screams of damned souls. It was past midnight. The standing room facilities were crowded, as were the miserable, filthy shacks. We sank heavily on the benches as if we were laden with lead. With eyes weighed down with fatigue, we watched the bread browning on the iron stove and listened to the samovar humming. In spite of all this, we sang. We settled down in the same room with several Ukrainian partisan fighters. After a while, they left the room behind us and went off into the night to get their prey. When it dawned, we saw a pile of incredibly dirty rags lying on the stove. There were mountains of stinking mud in the corners. But this is Russia. And it is just as typical of Russia that out of all this crap a little girl with a sweet, angelically beautiful face suddenly emerges. She had big eyes and blonde curls, and yet her beauty was destined to fade so quickly, and she would become like her grandmother, as ugly and dirty as a witch, that you wouldn't want to touch her even with a glove. Well, we cleaned out the pigsty. The Ukrainians helped us, grinning. They took out the dirt with shovels and boards. After that, the room became habitable. The day passed quickly. It started early, after a three-hour sleep. This was because we had to think about the horses first. But in the evening we sang again, feeling the satisfaction of a job well done during the day in order to rest well at night. As I hung up my guitar and sat on my blanket, as always the last one awake, enjoying a moment of solitude, a messenger arrived with orders. You are to be at six o'clock at the latest. I looked at the map. Yep, that's it. Up at three o'clock. Leaving at four o'clock. It's 22.00. Sleep fast, comrade. Franz and John were about to say something when I pulled the blankets off them at 3.00. John clung to his arm like a child to a mother's breast. He slept exactly an hour and a half after standing on the clock. The lone wagon creaked as it traveled along the river in the early morning along narrow paths, through villages where only sentries were awake, past silent thatched huts, with no smoke still rising from their chimneys. When we had to ford the Dnieper, we looked suspiciously at the ice. The wagon ran full speed across it, but the ice cracked under the rear wheels. We barely managed to reach a solid surface. Fedor, encouraged by our shouts, climbed ashore. Then we climbed a hill, from which we had a view of the river valley. The river is still just beginning here, but it already runs in a wide channel through a vast hilly plain. It has imprinted itself upon the landscape by its steep banks and the deep crevices of its tributaries. It formed a splendid wild scouring in these softly shaped hills, with their unplowed land and snowy fields covered with dark waves of forest, with pale gloomy bare bushes on the wide horizon. We enjoyed this view as we jolted in the wagon along the steep slope and crossed the plateau, where we ourselves could be seen from a distance. We loved looking at the villages, like eagles' nests standing on the edge of the bluffs above the river. This was a country that could defend itself even against a numerically superior enemy. We crossed another precipitous ravine, where Fedor held the wagon with his rump, dropping down on his hind legs. Then I went to report to the battalion Roiber, whose battalion is called by the name and rank of its commander, Roiber Captain. Everyone was still asleep. The enemy had not yet come close. However, signs of life were observed behind the four houses. This was the NP, 
and Lieutenant Ari spoke on the radio with his forward lookout at a considerable distance on the outpost. I picked up the house, set up our own radio link, and then motored between the artillery position, the NP, and my lodging. Meanwhile, the outpost made contact with the enemy. The observer repelled a couple of small attacks with the artillery battery, while confusing the enemy as to the location of the new defense line. He also counted his numbers from the long, marching columns that were approaching along various roads, and the advancing units entered the villages cautiously and cautiously. The outposts came out of the battle. The second act began with our shelling. The first village went up in flames, followed by the rest. But we didn't play this game to the point of insanity. It was enough that the enemy delayed the deployment of his troops for some time. The order to change position came early in the afternoon. We curled up and set off. We were still able to cross the open hillside safely. However, we were now walking alone and at a short distance from each other. Soon we came to another road leading in the opposite direction. We could not use the ford across the Dnieper. The sky was clear blue and the sun was blazing. The snow began to melt abundantly. The snow became wet and streams of melted water overflowed over the roads. We had to cross several muddy ravines. Twice the horse and wagon slipped down an incline. Fader was breathing like a steam engine. We had to give him a break several times. Radio communication with the regiment was maintained for the last time. When, after many roundabouts, we finally reached the highway, it had been dark for several hours and our part had long since passed. I drove forward in the truck, hoping to catch up with them, but it was too late. At midnight I decided to stop at Chi, because a night march into the unknown is a doubtful enterprise in this country. Besides, we were very tired. In spite of the wind and cold, Jan was almost falling from the charioteer's seat. His face was like a mask, distorted by the effort to stay awake. We reached the nearest prepared position. There we found a stall for the horse and room for ourselves by the stove along with a few of the infantry boys. I took out my guitar. The faces illuminated by the light of the fire formed a bright circle with the figures of the men seated in a tight circle. The next day we continued the march. We reached the great highway. Our feet were unaccustomed to the cobblestones, and they were sore, but the wagons rolled easily. In spite of the cold and the speed at which we moved, fatigue took hold of us again like an anesthesia. Occasionally we saw searchlights ahead, or parachute flares, or bomb explosions. In the pauses between these pictures there was only the wind of the dark plain, the clatter of hoofs and the rumble of wheels. When the sky in the east began to turn green, we turned off the road and entered the village which was to be our new disposition. The previous morning we had traveled twenty kilometers trying to catch up with the squad, now we had covered seventy. Between us, to say the least, this was quite enough. We didn't mind if the village consisted of miserable shacks with bedbugs. We didn't care if it was crowded or not, as long as there was room to squat somewhere. I took my satchel and blankets and slowly made my way toward the Red Sun, toward the house where our headquarters were located. On March 14 we walked along our new frontier, a frontier that was to be held. It had been well prepared. The dugouts are nearly completed, and the terrain has been explored. It is a miserable piece of ground, not distinguished by anything remarkable. But beyond this line the villages have been burned, and the enemy will not be very comfortable in the territory we have left behind. Our own position is good compared to the one he's got. Day after day we have been out in the open under the dazzling rays of the sun, passing through frozen fields over which the snow. One larks are rising. We do not expect to come in contact with the enemy until eighteen. At nine I put on my wool helmet, wrap a scarf around my face, and put gloves on my hands. Bedbugs fall from the ceiling right on my neck. They get on the table, brown and hungry, and the next minute they're already walking on the hands of your arms. Lieutenant O pierces them with a needle and holds them over the candle flame curving his upper lip in disgust. The ceiling is papered with a selection of last year's illustrated newspapers, along with single issues of Russian newspapers and torn strips of wallpaper. 
There's the Fuhrer's car coming at us. Stalin with his square head threatening us, smiling women and attacking soldiers on the battlefields of Earth. It's like a dim mirror in which all the apocalyptic years are captured like a ghastly rigor mortis. There to the east, the enemy attacks more fiercely. Sometimes the noise of battle comes here and it seems as if the familiar thud of a tank gun blasting its way through the front. We sniff the air and breathe in that odor. But the enemy is making his way through our sector very slowly. Today he came into firing contact with our forward strongholds, which are holding back his advance beyond the outposts proper. They are there to divert attention away from our new frontier. It is not yet quite within range of our howitzers, but our guns can reach it and at night an aerial adjuster goes up and directs their fire, focusing on the lights of the Russian camp, which stand out against the desert terrain. The enemy cannot avoid these lights. In such a harsh climate with no roof over their heads, all the time stepping into the unknown, constantly without dry shoes and dry clothes, without supplies of bread and with guns that do not advance because bridges are blown up and roads are broken by German columns. So we have to light fires at night, and because of excessive fatigue it does not occur to us that someone, like a malicious insect, is flying in the sky, directing the shells so that they lie on the lights. The stars fade in the upward surge of fire that fills the milky blue sky, and again the incomparable kaleidoscope of colors from the lights of the last of the remaining villages before the main firing line. The air is so still you can almost feel the terrible heat. Then, after a few hours, the lights fade and disappear into the blue of the night, giving it dark red and purple hues. On March 22, 1943, I was promoted to the rank of lieutenant, which was considered effective as of March 1. My seniority in rank had not yet been clarified, but for the moment I was given command of the Artillery Instrumental Reconnaissance Section in the old regiment. During the last few days, the enemy has been slowly infiltrating the areas we have prepared for him. On the evening of the 21st, the companies in the forward strongpoints were pulled back to the general line of defense, and we have now begun shelling. Tonight, for the first time, a small party of the enemy bypassed the outpost and rushed upon our wire fences. They lost 18 men killed, and two more were taken prisoner. Gradually, the front comes to life. The enemy's machine guns, mortars, and anti-tank guns are coming into action. Our own guns drown out everything. Their rumble is more powerful than anything else, and the trajectories of the shells are directed at the target like rays of the sun focused in a lens. Today an officer of the Russian artillery headquarters was captured at one of our outposts. The staffers were driving blind to one of the positions in a truck. Unfortunately, they had already passed the machine gun positions and were shot, so the truck was smashed to pieces. However, one of them, an adjutant of one of the higher officers in the artillery, surrendered to us. He gave us important details about the enemy, as well as encouraging details about the success of our defenses. End of March A wet wind is blowing with low-hanging clouds, and the trenches are full of water. The snow is growing scarcer every day. As soon as the topsoil thaws, the snow dissolves into a muddy slurry and overhangs the hard ground beneath. Delivering ammunition becomes difficult. It is hard on the horses. Our daily outlay is ten times that of the enemy, who have so far managed to pull up a few light infantry guns. We're taking down our outpost today. I'm sitting here, writing it all down for the unit's war diary. Events. Dates. Actors. It's not exciting work. There are selections and notes accumulated over the month on the table, and a small typewriter stands in the middle waiting to be used. I don't feel like doing it today at all. A small bedbug runs across the desk in the daylight, and there is only a red spot left of it. But there are many more of them, tiny, agile, as small as fall spiders, and dark, nasty ones that we pierce, and whose bellies swell in the candle flame before bursting. Often we jump out of our chairs and tear off our tunics because, after all, another little creep is sitting on the collar post. My depression continued until I was entertained by a conversation between one of the soldiers in the next room and Wilhelm, our volunteer assistant. 
Wilhelm is 15 years old and joined us in Rajev. He ran away from his mother, and now the German soldiers are raising him in their own way, rough and fatherly. They talk to him in their own language, and it's funny to listen to. Where is this going? They tell him. When was the last time you washed your face? Yesterday. Go wash your face. Go get some water. Hey you, Russian. And Wilhelm laughs and walks away. He has grown up, and his face has rounded out noticeably. He laughs and his eyes narrow, and at night he sleeps at the soldier's feet with the sleep of a fifteen-year-old. It is sometimes said that war makes men undisciplined and cruel, that soldiers find it difficult to return to a measured life one day. This is nonsense. It is true that war has disturbed the old order of things within us and demanded a reassessment of values. It has dulled our sensibilities in the same way that frost freezes everything. But it is equally valid to say that it has made people simpler and better, that it has purified the soul, because the war has revealed to us the values that matter when everything else collapses, such as humanity, empathy, comradeship between people. Since three o'clock this morning, our phone has been ringing nonstop. The enemy is attacking all along the front line. It is as if he does not realize that now he is advancing on the frontier, which will be held. There's no other way to explain his pathetic efforts. It is true that the artillery has been activated, firing intensely, and his ketiushas have also already been pulled up. But it is unlikely that he can afford a sufficiently large consumption of ammunition to carry on a prolonged bombardment. It is impossible to organize a supply system for one day alone in a devastated area with blown-up bridges, undermined railroad tracks, and with roads drowning in mud. So let it come. We are not concerned. During the night, a small enemy force broke through to our position and was driven back by a counterattack thirty minutes later. All other attacks were repulsed, and as of midday Ivan has calmed down a bit. Our observers are able to view supply roads and enemy staging areas. Aerial surveillance, which has been in place since morning, completes the rest. As long as ammunition is coming in, we have more room for action. Ivan never once had a word to say in reply. His divisions are the same ones that met us at Urshev, and a few more. Everything said there were five of them, plus two artillery regiments. The artillerymen have brought up a respectable number of guns in the last few days, but the rifle divisions are poorly equipped with artillery. In any case, Ivan should know that he does not have enough of it for an assault, even if he is counting on the pitiful remnants of a tank brigade, which is hardly worth talking about. For us to take him seriously, he will have to pull up a lot more guns and not skimp on armored vehicles. As I was left to myself during these morning hours, I thought I would use the typewriter to talk to you. You don't have to rack your brains too much when typing, and the setting is so suitable for it this morning, when the fresh wind finally blew and the pale sun shone again. Last year's yellow stubble forms colored spots on the fields, and the first sprouts have appeared on them, the former collective farm fields. The last islands of snow in shady places don't count anymore. These are days in the year when we suddenly feel that the forces of nature are at work again, that our field too will be plowed again to bring in a new harvest. It is a manifestation of God's mercy after the past God-forgotten months. And that's why my heart is light today. On the other side, at the top of the brown hill, two men are walking with heavy poles. They carry them on bent backs and the poles over their heads with the ends pointing skyward, like the poles of the local crane wells. The whole thing impresses me enough to be worthy of writing and telling you about it. I don't know if you're interested in hearing about it, about the black, deep furrow the tractor made in this poor field of stubble, about the little oasis of warmth at the bottom of the dried-up riverbed, about the lark over the field or the flowering hazel bush. I just know they have something to say to me in this countryside that is so stingy with beauty. How can you stand being here so long? One of the arrivals from the Southern Front asked me some time ago. But it's very simple. If you don't have abundance, you have to make do with little. And one flower can mean more than a whole flower bed. For four weeks we've been busy building our headquarters. Today we moved in. It's not the only decent building in the area.
but it looks pretty nice, perched on the southern slope of a small low-lying area. Three rooms are connected by a corridor on the valley side. The windows face south, and between them are two trenches of approaches, evenly sloping down the slope, so that if you take the view from the outside, there is a certain architectural harmony in the whole. The terrain has a slight slope back towards a small river. Across the slope is a path connecting the headquarters with the dugouts on each side. The skill of the carpenters was evident in the completion of the dugouts. A woodcarver from the mountainous Rayom region crafted tables, doors, clothes racks, and a comfortable seating area in the corner. The walls were covered with burlap stapled together with cross birch laths. The ceiling was covered with sturdy gray paper, and there were niches in the walls for books. All this is done in a simple and unassuming peculiar style. The command post has a tablet table, wall maps, and telephones. The other two dugouts have living and sleeping quarters. They are clean, bright, and spacious. Our dugout is getting better and better. We now find it quite natural on arriving somewhere to settle in the woods or fields. In former days, we thought it only required a house. We asked for flower seeds and were going to plant vegetables as well. We had already planted young fir trees and shrubs. Soldiers don't usually have to use the harvest from the fruit trees they plant. War and agriculture are different things. But anyway, it's worth starting. It is so interesting. The air is light and fresh. Everything is drowned in sunshine, as well as birdsong. The wind is like a little brother. These are the wonderful days between frost and heat, the cold nights and oppressive evenings when clouds of mosquitoes serenade us. These are the days of the year that put things into perspective. The dirt is already drying, hardening, and cracking like plaster. Soon it will crumble into sand under feet, wheels, and hooves. The first cloud of dust is already rising over the freeway. April 24, 1943 Yesterday for the first time the temperature was nearly 18 degrees. Lieutenant Von Ruhl went to the estate that once belonged to his great-uncle. He picked some wild flowers in the park, delicate blue windflowers with clear leaves and white pistols. The sun is streaming through our windows, flooding the tablet table with light. P is making final adjustments to our topographical map, which covers 18 kilometers. He sprinkles the map with dust from his boots, so that the watercolor paint we use to smudge over erroneous marks doesn't spread. He has his own method, one of our many artisanal techniques. The front is calm. If there's any shooting, it's ours firing. We have quite a lot of work to do. Connected with air reconnaissance, our radio station yesterday was in reception from 1.00 to 3.00 and from 5.00 to 6.00. It is often controlling the fire of three batteries on three different targets at the same time. Judging from the reports of our own observers and the testimony of deserters, the results of the fire are excellent. In honor of Easter, we decorated our sleeping quarters with birch garlands. We hung some pictures and attached a couple of vases to the walls. One was a small metal mug held on three pencils. The other was an old tin can that I wrapped with paper. We put sprigs of hazel in them the leaves reaching for the light. We can lie comfortably on our straw mattresses laid out on makeshift beds. We even have a piece of white linen cloth for each plus a blue stamped bedspread and pillowcase. At night I can take off my pants and go to bed in just my shirt. It may not be easy for you to understand what that means, but I can tell you that every night I go to bed feeling grateful for it. So, Easter Sunday, it could be like this. Soldiers lying in the grass in a low spot or squatting, squinting into the light and laughing at the crude jokes of the concert goers. The sun gathers here as if caught in the hollow of huge palms. The elastic air vibrates in the sunlight. Beyond the lowland rises a grain field. You can see the tender green sprouts rising higher each day. They breathe in the moist, warm air and the greens grow darker. In birch groves, the first young leaves that have broken through contrast with the dull gray background. It is as if a breath of life has been breathed on them. Last year's grass still lies yellow and dry as an old man's hair in many fields, but new shoots are sprouting powerfully underneath. 
Today, the first spring thunderstorms rolled across the land in the changing light. They seem shorter and more violent than at home, but maybe that's because we can watch them in all their glory. They fill the whole sky with their astonishing power, dominating the whole terrain, so that when they leave, their breath spreads around in all their splendor. Once huge hailstones sprinkled on the road, but then steam rose abundantly over the wet ground, and it glistened like a horse after a good gallop. Soon we will plow the land and sow grain, even here on the front line. Our life is divided into periods. When the years are gone, irretrievably, forever, all that remains is to clench one's teeth. It's naive to think that we'll be rewarded for them, because all unrealized opportunities of the past period are irrevocably lost forever. No one sows in the summer, but it may be naive to discuss this as well. I tell myself this because in this war, more than in any other before it, thoughts revolve around the meaning of what is happening. My own opinions are far from unequivocal. But here, in one of the greatest chapters of human history, the Prussian spirit must definitely be shown in its final form. At the same time, the best part of the Germans face the inevitability without closing their eyes to it. And this inevitability they perceive as an inescapable call, which in one important respect surpasses what was demanded of the soldiers in 1914. We are experiencing a chilling experiment. We pulled up to our forward echelon. The sun was smiling, and the plucking wind clapped joyfully around us. A string of motorcycles swung across the road where the wagons were traveling and turned toward the freeway. Franz Wolf sped off, and with the engine rumbling quietly, we rolled over the roots under the last tall spruce trees. Then we turned off the motor. The wind had died down. The sun fell diagonally across the trees and flooded the camp with a wave of light. There was the smell of tar and horses. The space between the stalls was cleanly swept. Blockhouses and round tents lay peacefully arranged around the perimeter. In the middle was an open space where the mercenaries were gathered for swearing in. They looked neat in their tunics with white armbands and emblemless pilots. Clean and fed. The interpreter was a young Russian. He emerged quietly from the woods, his rifle hanging loosely on his shoulder, clean tanned face, unbuttoned collar and movements like a beast, a combination of endurance and agility. He spoke well, jerking his head away from his notes and backing up his words with gestures. The mercenaries stood clothed in the open and listened with intense attention. Is it true what I read out to you? He asked. True, they nodded. It is as it is. Their faces petrified. They swore the oath without hesitation, binding themselves to serve faithfully, just as they had served when they joined us, or when they were taken prisoners, on their way back to Smolensk, or Kalinin, or Rzhev. They knew it wasn't a bad deal. All they had to do was keep an eye on them. But they said they had questions, and I said, spit it out. Are they now on an equal footing with the German soldiers? Some of them asked. They were thinking about the ration of schnapps. It was not difficult to read that in their faces. And I asked through the interpreter if they had ever been hungry during the whole time they had been with us. They laughed. Everyone laughed. And we were already friends. Others asked if they could be turned over to Vlasov's army. And they insisted on answering that question. They were few in number but they were the best. They were people worth looking at. Their questions were crisp and clear, and with their calloused hands they signed fluently, and with a determination that would never have been expected of them. The sunlight was streaming through the fir trees, the finches were waving their tails, and the tits were chirping animatedly in the branches as we sat by the little hut in the woods and had a long talk about many things in connection with it all. 